Um, hello and uh, welcome to the fifth annual BBF Regional Council Summit. Um, and I think this is a time where you need to applaud. Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Ali Jeng. I am one of the regional managers uh, for BBF. I cover Shittenden and Franklin Grand Isle. Um, it is with great privilege that we are all here today to talk a little bit about Regional Council Summit on Equitable Inclusion Community Engagement in this beautiful space. And I really would like to have my Regional Council colleagues to please stand up. And since we are modeling um, equity, we need to model best practices. I'm going to call them by name because I don't know how to say Linda's last name. <laughs> Um, so please give it to um, Courtney. Yep, I guess. Um, we have Kelly Hayes right here. Uh, we have Darla over there. And uh, Linda. Yes. Um, this event, we could not do it without the help and the support of all the BBF staff. And you will see them around today with their BBF um, name tags with the logo and please if you have any questions you can ask them right um, and we have also a great photo booth set up upstairs there will be some staff right there to help you um, answer some questions take beautiful pictures to be able to tell a story um, and as you know it is important to know where to exit in case of emergency what can go wrong nothing right <laughs> but we have a bathroom right there when you exit that room, right, on your right. And also this room, actually this one, right, there is a bathroom right there as well, right? If we would like also for people to just feel free, right, to not, um, to have good time, right? Please feel free to stand up, walk upstairs, stand up, walk around, right? I think that's what really we want to see today, right? We also want to learn. We also want to grow. We also want to teach. We also want to receive some knowledge to be able to go back to our um, municipalities, our region, and be able to build, to engage, and to make the state a better place. Right? So without further ado, please give it a round of applause to the BBF Executive Director, Dr. Morgan Crossman, for some opening remarks about the day. Thank you. Um, Before I start, someone on my team needs to take a picture because I did not bring my feisty seven-year-old. You are all welcome, but I did tell her <laughs> that I was going to start opening remarks like this with our photo booth. Thank you, Courtney. Because I do want to invite you all to spend some time at the photo booth. One of the really important things that we are working on as a staff, as a team, as a network, as a system, is how do we share the voices of families and communities? How do we elevate those? What does that mean? How do we do it in an authentic way? So what we want to hear from each of you today is what's going well for you and your family, and what would make things better for your family. So you're going to hear me talk a little bit about both my family this morning in open, opening remarks, but also some families that I met with over the last week. Uh, that I think will help us be really grounded and also super vulnerable in the space we're in. And I want to see everybody show up really authentically throughout the day from wherever you are. If you're having a rough morning, if you are having a great morning, give someone next to you a hug because they might not be. But I want us to really be able to be in the space today talking about diversity, talking about equity, inclusion, social justice. What does it mean for kids and families across the state What's working well, what is not, and how do we problem solve to move that work forward? Um, so I'm really, I'm so proud of the team for today's Regional Council Summit. This is one of our favorite days of the year. Some people think that my favorite day is Data Super Bowl, which is State of Vermont's children, but actually, <laughs> actually, it is being with folks that are actually doing the work on the ground 
and that we have the connection to the folks who are seeing kids and families every single day because you are actually the experts. You're the ones who know what the tensions are, what the challenges are, where they're fighting and where their success is. And to me, that's one of the most powerful parts of our entire network at Building Bright Futures. There's no way for me or any other staff member on our team to do our work well, to be able to advise the governor, the legislature, uh, any decision maker on what they should do for kids and families without what you are doing actually working with kids and families. So just inviting you to be in that space with me this morning um, and, and hear a little bit about how our team is thinking about our collective responsibility, right? When we think about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social justice, when we think about the early childhood system, it doesn't work if only one of us is doing it, right? It's a collective responsibility to think about how we are engaging in the work. There's also a personal responsibility. So I am going to talk a little bit about where I feel like I am personally as a way to be vulnerable to hope that you will talk about that today as we're doing a series of exercises. But you know, there is this personal responsibility and journey and this continuum that really informs our ability to think about how to lead this work, how to show up for our teams, how to show up for our families, whether it's our own personal family or whether it's the families that we're supporting. As I think about the work of Building Bright Futures, you know, I've been here for about five years now. I hope you're not sick of me just yet. But five years and we've, we've seen a lot of transformation in the work and I think What's been incredible in the last year is that we've, we've leaned in in a different way to thinking about how we elevate family and community voice and to think a little bit differently about what it means to be in communities and to elevate that work. And we've brought in this incredible team of consultants through creative discourse to help us do it better because we also know we're not the experts. So even though we're each on this personal journey, we need coaches, we need people to help us figure out what that step is, what it looks like, how we should be moving through it. And that's also why we're bringing them to you today. We want you all to have that same level of, okay, here's where we are, here's the next step in our personal journey, here's how we can think about it to create change on behalf of the system for kids and families. What we think about right now as a system is that we are about to update the strategic plan Right? So Building Bright Futures, you all as a part of Building Bright Futures and the network are a part of building the vision and strategy for early childhood. That strategic plan will be the next five years of how we are moving and what we are moving towards. And we want you to build that with us. And so how do we do that? Really focusing on equity, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. What does that mean? And what does it mean in an authentic way, not just the words on the page? So that's what I want you to think about as we're moving through today's session. How do we do that well together? How do we make sure that every level of the network feels engaged in the process of updating that vision and strategy? And um, in order to really ground us in that work, I want to give uh, one really important example of where I have seen firsthand the, the need to elevate the voice of children and families that are most vulnerable right now and that is in housing. Who here is from Rutland? Okay, hi Rutland friends. I was in Rutland two weekends ago volunteering at the Cortina Inn. Not with my professional hat on, but actually took my mom and my daughter to Rutland to say, okay, let's just go see how we can help kids and families who are being um, unsheltered or unhoused from hotels recognizing that the places that we have and the, the, the places that we have created are not necessarily the best practice or the most safe. What do children and families need on the ground right now? And what I saw was so hard, right? It was seeing families and kids on the worst day of their life. It was seeing families, it was seeing young moms with infants, it was seeing uh, children with disabilities and special health care needs, spina bifida, autism spectrum disorder. It was young kids trying to prepare to go camping, right? Do those kids have a full understanding of what is happening in that moment? Probably not. Do those parents? In some cases, yes, right? And so how do we think about the youngest and most vulnerable kids and families and what their needs are, and how do we remove the politics from it 
and the finger pointing from it. And how do we elevate those stories and those voices? Because when I walked out of Rutland that day, my immediate thought was, okay, I'm gonna do all the things. What can I personally do? And it's actually our collective responsibility to figure out what we need to do at all of the levels, right? There is emergency response that you all are already providing, right? You are the ones on the ground trying to problem solve and help find housing, clothes, shelter, diapers, wipes, all of those things. That's one level of responsibility. But now how do we take everything that you are seeing? That's data, right? You are the ones that know what's happening on the ground for kids and families. How do we take that and bring it to our strategic plan committees and our policy recommendations and put it really concretely in a very serious way in front of decision makers to say, Yes, we know we have funding issues. Yes, we know we have so many different levels of crises. Yes, we know that sometimes there are adults that are making decisions that we can't control, but it doesn't matter because we have kids and families that are not well and that are not safe. So how do we use every bit of the power, the collective power in this room and the expertise to help inform and advise? Because to me, that's such a concrete example of the importance of the work you're all doing. You're the ones that are working with kids and families. You see it. How do we help you elevate it? How do you elevate it? And how do we give families themselves the opportunity to elevate it? I'm not going to share the picture I have on my phone from a little girl whose mom texted me this morning a picture of her with Amelie's hat on and Minnie Mouse from their trailer because they don't have heat or hot water or any of those things. However, it's important that we are both thinking about our personal responsibility and how we want to show up on the ground or with our families. It's just as important to figure out how to elevate and get our policy and decision makers to show up in a different way and to let them know what it really means. Like, what does this mean on the ground for kids and families? So I share that example because as I think about elevating, elevating the voices of those most mar mar marginalized, these are infants and children who don't have a voice and may not even know that where they are living or their situation is unsafe or you know that they are unwell. Amelie played with these kids. They were having fun. How do we be the voice and advocate on behalf of them and on behalf of the system? I'm going to end by um, telling you a little bit about where I am personally with the equity journey. When I thought about creative discourse coming in and what I thought we were going to be doing in thinking about equity and inclusion and social justice on behalf of the strategic plan, this isn't what I thought I would be doing. It's such a personal journey as well. Um, and I've been doing a lot of thinking about my own personal biases. And again, as you're going through the exercise in the workshop this morning, like these are the, some of the things that might come up for you, and that's OK. So some of the things that I've been thinking about in how I want to show up as a leader and where I feel like I might have pushed our work in amazing ways might have also perpetuated these dominant cultural issues and tensions around white supremacy, right? And some of those, my team is going to laugh. It's OK. You can urgency, professionalism, perfectionism, setting a really high bar for myself, my team, all of you and the system, right? Sometimes setting unrealistic goals and timelines around how quickly we want to move things, expecting that change and systems change is really hard. And even more so, when I personally have power, when I should exert that power, and when I should be sharing or moving that power to someone else. So I'm naming some of those because I want you all to feel like you can show up today and be in that space, right? How are you showing up? What is the work we need to collectively do together? And think about who you want to be as a leader and how you want to show up in the state of Vermont and what change you really want to make. For me, it's around integrity and transparency and compassion and social justice and creating a brave space so that you can all show up in an authentic way and that I can help bring you into the right spaces to make change. I'm going to end with a very long quote, so bear with me, because now I'm actually going to read at you for a minute. So this is the Working Pledge from the State of Vermont Truth and Reconciliation <laughs> Commission. It was the Truth and Healing, and it was in search of a common memory event on Friday, October 11th at the State House. 
as we explore complex and challenging topics such as race, disability, oppression, discrimination, we collectively pledge to approach these discussions with a commitment to extend grace, humility, and empathy with each other. We recognize that we are both on an individual and collective journey to dismantle oppression and discrimination from our culture and systems. Therefore, we pledge to cultivate dignity and respect, even in moments of disagreement and discomfort. We expect and accept, accept non-closure, and with that, we engage in courageous conversations with curiosity and an open mind. We dedicate ourselves to refrain from the judgment, embrace active listening, and use I statements to foster open communication. In this space, we understand that the platinum rule where we pledge to abide by each other's unique perspectives, thereby building better relationships and collaboration. We come into this with good intentions, and we recognize that even when we do not intend to do harm, there's an impact. We commit to prioritizing Act 128 communities and acknowledge that there's no such thing as single issue struggle. Our lives are interconnected. We vow to treat each other, our stories, our dreams, and struggles with sacred care. We honor vulnerability. We embrace the spirit of co-creation. We affirm that we are active agents of change, and we're committed to doing the work to create understanding amongst and with each other. The journey to collective liberation is filled with discomfort and painful truths, but the final destination is community where everyone can thrive together. This is a shared space grounded in the principles of this pledge. So I invite you to stay in that space with us for the day and really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much, and please another round of applause for Morgan Pressman. Yeah, uh, it was uh, so beautiful. How do we show up? How do we show for our team, for our family, and for our community? And that's what we are going to talk about soon with the creative discourse. Um, but before, we now live in the DNA of technology, right? So some people are asking to not do flash photography. Right? You can take pictures, of course. We also have Orca Media right here with us to record um, the summit. And Orca, this workshop will not be recorded, um, just like we talked about. Um, the next part of our agenda is the uh, panel discussion. And this panel is being led by Susanna Davis. No one will introduce Susanna anymore uh, because of the great work that she does for the state of Vermont. And I recently learned she's a new mom, too. So welcome to the club. <laughs> Thank you. So without further ado, Susanna will introduce the panelists, and the panelists will introduce themselves. And we have Jacob Bogre, Executive Director of Association African Living in Vermont, can tell more about himself a little bit. Um, Melody Walker Marking, Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commissioner and the leader of the Abenaki community in Vermont. We have Shana Trader, CZ, Rainbow Bridge Community Center, Rainbow Relief Program Manager at Barrie, Vermont. And we have Kendra Laroche, Executive Director of the Special Needs Support Center, Upper Valley, Vermont, and New Hampshire. Please welcome uh, Susanna Davis, Executive Director of the Racial Equity and Inclusion Belonging of the State of Vermont. Thank you, Susanna, for being here. Buenas tardes. I thought I heard it. Thank you. It feels so good when you say it back. How's my volume? Can people hear me okay? No? Okay. I'm a yell. That's my favorite thing to do. Um, thank you for joining us. Today we are going to scream about, um, about equity, about service delivery, and about some of the experiences that our esteemed panelists are having as part of their work. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. As Ali already mentioned, I'm Susana Davis, the Racial Equity Director for the state, and um, a member of the State Advisory Council as well for BBF. Um, so it's really uh, an honor and a privilege to be able to, to join you all in the different facets of, of the work. I'm gonna go through who our panelists are again, um, just because I can, because you gave me a microphone. So of course, 
Uh, over here, we have Jacob Boger from the uh, Association of Africans Living in Vermont, Melody on the far end um, from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I'm sorry. I think there's a meeting happening because Teams is blowing up right now. So we're just going to mute that. Sorry, not there. Can't help. From the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and also who serves as a leader in Vermont's um, indigenous, specifically the Abenaki community. We have Shauna Trader uh, from the Rainbow Relief Program and the Rainbow Bridge Community Center. And then of course, Kendra LaRoche, uh, Executive Director for the Special Needs Support Center in the Upper Valley, covering Vermont and New Hampshire. So I'm noticing just from uh, titles that we've got a really broad representation of demographic groups, right? I'm seeing groups that are dedicated to supporting people of different racial groups, um, people of different abilities, people from different um, gender or sexual minority groups, et cetera. So just thinking a little bit about the ways in which we're reaching the various sectors of our population through those different identifiers. I'm imagining a series of circles forming some kind of a Venn diagram and thinking about all the different intersection points that each of those groups actually has with one another. So with that as kind of a backdrop, um, I'd like to just start first and ask a really, a really basic question, maybe um, for, for myself and for some others in the room. Would each of you tell us a little bit about yourself, about the services and the supports that your organization provides and the demographics you serve? And I'll start on the end with Melody because you're looking at me. Um, hi, and I apologize if I cough. I, I am recovering from pneumonia for, for about three weeks. So I am here, and I will not get you sick. Um, um, so I'm part of the Vermont Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and, um, and, and I wear a few different hats, right? And so one of the other things that I do on the weekends, because I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old, is um, we started working with uh, NCSS to um, have an Abenaki toddler group, and we provide books. And really, anybody who wants to come, whether they're Abenaki or not, um, can come. So we have lots of kids that come to our programs, and we always include our elders. It's just like the coolest thing ever. And um, my daughter's super sassy, so I'm glad that other people can experience that as well. <laughs> um, and so, um, tomorrow, we're actually unveiling for the VTRC our strategic plan. Um, and we're going to start taking stories and not stories, truths. There's a difference. And so um, we're hoping that we can really examine the systems in Vermont and see where there's issues. We want to hear from everybody, um, and we want to work with lots of organizations, um, legislators, individuals, impacted community members. Um, so that's what what kind of support I could give, I guess, for um, in that way. Um, <coughs> And did I answer all the questions? Yeah. There was a whole bunch. <laughs> hey, I'm Hello. Hello? There you go. I might need the mic because I'm a little bit softer of a speaker. Hello, everyone. My name is Shauna. Um, I use all pronouns. I am with the Rainbow Bridge Community Center. Uh, it's a queer nonprofit right in downtown Barrie. I know everyone's like, what? Barrie? Yes. <laughs> The gays are up in Barrie, and we have our own community center. We're very proud of it. Um, we do a ton of work. Um, we work with all people, youths, older folks. Um, we have a support group for parents of trans people. I'm one of the co-facilitators of it. It's called Trans Guardians. Everyone's welcome to attend it if you have a young trans person in your life. Um, it's phenomenal work. In addition to that, we have the Rainbow Relief Program. This was set up last year after the catastrophic floods in central Vermont. This really helps folks standing at the crossroads of chronic poverty and disaster recovery. Um, so I work with individuals and families in that respect. Um, I'm also the chair of Barry Up, which is a long-term recovery group in Barry City. So we're working hard to bring housing back online in Barry. And again, our mission is vulnerable folk centered. So we have a lot of children, families, folks with disabilities, etc. Folks that are often overlooked by federal programs and other programs that really center home ownership and business ownership as the requisite for receiving care. 
So we're super proud of that. I'm also a parent of two teenagers. That's where I'm coming from. Is this on? Yes, good. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Kendra LaRoche. I'm the executive director of the Special Needs Support Center. And I mentioned earlier that I have a disability. Um, I'm loud and proud about that. Um, I did have some people say, what is your disability? Because I can't see it. And yes, it is an invisible disability. Um, so right with some of our labels, um, some are visible and some are invisible, and mine is a traumatic brain injury. Um, and uh, the reason that uh, Ali said that we should not have flash photography is because I would fall right on the ground and you would not hear me speak anymore today. So uh, that's, that's the reason I appreciate you not doing that. Um, so the Special Needs Support Center is not only disability-led, but we are disability-staffed, so 80% of our staff have disabilities. Uh, we have reserved board seats for people with disabilities. We, our goal is to not just speak for people with disabilities, but to be the people who should be listened to. That being said, um, we, what we do is we go into businesses and organizations, and in this case, maybe they'd be after school programs or early ed centers of any kind, and uh, we have a disability friendly certification process. So we would go in, we would give you recommendations, we do walkthroughs, we talk about physical space, we, talked about, we talk about staff training. Uh, we can also work with you on maybe particular issues with particular disabilities or a particular child. We can talk about behavior plans. So we can do all of those different things. Um, and sometimes when you are looking for help for someone, if you're like, oh, we, we need to talk to people with disabilities. The hard part is, just like all of these other identifiers, we get asked like three times a week to be part of these community groups that talks, you know, we want the disability perspective, and oh, it's exhausting, right? So that's one of our jobs is to come in and help you have that perspective without exhausting the folks that you are um, trying to hear from as well. Want to just take it? Great. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for having me here. My name is Yakuba Jacob Bogre, and I work uh, with uh, the Association of Africans Living in Vermont. And like uh, the name suggests, we do not work only with Africans. We work with many groups of refugees and immigrants. We have chosen Vermont as their home for, so they can rebuild their new lives. And uh, we also are not a refugee resettlement agency. We work with uh, these folks who have been resettled here for their post-resettlement need. And as such, we do provide a wide range of services ranging from general case management to immigration support. And also, with all the trauma our families have gone through, we've started a behavioral health program to support those who need counseling. And we are doing that in partnership with uh, the University of Vermont uh, Psychology Department and those who are You who know that it's so called also Connecting Cultures. And also running uh, focus groups and uh, therapy groups with various groups, like the Nepali group, the African Swahili speakers group, and the Somali groups. That also helps them. For those who don't want to go through traditional therapy or counseling, they can have at least a circle where they can share their experience and see how they can be peer, they can support each other. And uh, we are a staff of 20 at ALV, coming from various segments of the community. Our approach is to hire folks who are coming from the resettled community so they can better support their peers. No one can be an expert in a culture if you are not coming from that culture. I can read books, I can learn from teachers, but I would not be able to represent a culture unless I am from that specific ethnic or cultural group. And uh, we do also provide a lot of interpretation services. We have a pool of 72 interpreters, all of them working part-time to help with language support. As you know, the state has many small groups of refugees that were resettled over the past 40 years. And uh, not everyone speaks English. Therefore, we have to always rely on interpreters who can help us communicate or help providers communicate when they are meeting with groups they are trying to support or families they are trying to support. And uh, with that also, we have to train them. So we first do general assessment to see their language proficiency in English and their native language, train them for interpreter medical training, it's about six hours, and court training, 
and also working with uh, social service agencies so they can train specific interpreters who can work directly with them. And those in, uh, individuals are just part-timers, but they do play a vital role with uh, ALE. Mm. You know, one of the things that I'm hearing threaded through all of your responses is this idea of lived experience and about um, representation, right? Melody, you talked about collecting stories, um, and, and this is an organ of government, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So the idea that government is not only willing to hear, but invested in collecting those truths. I'm sorry, you, did, you didn't talk about collecting stories, you talked about collecting truths. Yes, there is a difference. <laughs> Um, and the, the fact that government would be invested in hearing those truths, the qualitative data piece from people is so important. I'm also hearing that, um, Shauna, when you talked about being vulnerable folks centered, right? And, and you talked specifically about serving people who are overlooked by agencies and entities who should have their back, right? Which, which, which Jakub, I'm also hearing in your response when you talk about things like case management, providing interpreters. These are services that we would expect government or ancillary agencies, agencies to cover. Um, and then of course, Kendra, you also talking about not just speaking on behalf of people living with disabilities, but actually having people with lived experience be in that seat and relieving the burden from others who constantly get tasked with being the token representative. You all are busy. <laughs> And I imagine you, you've been busy for a long time, um, but I'm wondering if you could share with us, since a handful of years ago, um, let's say since the onset of COVID-19 pandemic, have you seen an increase or decrease um, in the level of access to the services that you all are providing? And you can feel free to respond in, in any order you like. Okay, I can start. You know, I said earlier that uh, the state has resettled many small groups from various parts of the world. And uh, one thing we've noticed since COVID is the disparity in access. To Yakub, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Can you speak a little closer to okay. the mic? Sorry. One thing we've noticed is uh, the disparity in access to care, mostly health care. Families that are coming for underserved communities, like uh, the refugee population, were somehow left out. During COVID, we had to do a lot of outreach to the communities, explaining what the disease was and what uh, the prevention stages are so they can help mitigate the risk of propagating this disease in their community. We run clinics at ALG, from uh, testing to vaccine clinics. And that also pushed us not to close fully like many agencies where people could work from home. Our case managers were therefore call after July 5th to come back to the office. We were asked to use a preventative methods so that we don't uh, contaminate or share the disease among each other. But it's really hard working with someone who do not speak English. We need help filling their benefit application to just be on the phone, the person does not speak English, and calling a provider who is maybe somewhere else and the, fall, uh, the call will drop after 15, 20 minutes. You will make that call twice or three times sometime before that person is able to certify their benefits and submit an application. That's how we realized that traditional methods of communication would never work for some of the underserved population. We've reached out to the state and thanks God, they agreed to at least allow one of the methods of communication, which is WhatsApp that many groups use to at least make calls despite uh, some of the concern about privacy or uh, EPA violation. Because sometimes we think uh, that having a phone service is granted. But if you don't have the money to pay that line, it will be cut. But if you have access to free internet, you can place your call without restriction. And that's one of the beauty of WhatsApp. And ALV right now use that most of the time to communicate with the, uh, their uh, service, uh, those who are accessing services at ALV and working with kids also to make sure that because most of them are coming from countries or areas where they did not have access to technology, so they can be online and access classes remotely. That was one of the burdens. Many kids in our community miss those classes and are now trying to catch up. Imagine you getting here at 16 or 17, 
not being assessed based on your academic performance, but placed in a classroom because of your age with some of your age mates, and being asked to perform at their level, you will not be able to succeed. They will push you through the system, you will graduate after high school, but you are not ready for anything. You know, it's good that the state is bringing folks here to help them rebuild their life, but we should also put some resources to help them be productive member of our community. These men and women want to contribute. They want to give back to the state that is resettling them. But we just need to make sure that we provide that level of support. And that's one of the services we've seen increase at ALB, providing support to youth because they are lacking a lot and they've missed a lot since COVID. And this gap is hard to fill within a short period of time. The other thing we've seen also is the immigration. For those of you who work with families who need immigration benefits to access public services like SSI, the Supplemental Security Income, you know that when a refugee enters the country, they have seven years to become citizen. If they were disabled, for example, and after seven years they are not citizen, they will lose that benefit. Same for the kids who might be also affected because of their disability. So we've seen with the backlog, many families losing their benefit because they couldn't become citizen. After being in the country for five years, some are now getting their green cards. Imagine those who came like two years before COVID and we had this huge backlog. Their petition were pending. Now they become, they got their green card, they can apply for citizenship, but they lost this vital support of having access to SSI or the kids lost that support because they, their parents were not a citizen. So these are things that we are really still dealing with because of the previous backlog of due to COVID and also this, the increased need of adapting our services so we can fill the gaps that we've seen since that period. Thank you. I'm actually blown away by the um, amount of similarities there are between what you just said and the disability community. Um, so COVID also hit the disability community very hard. Um, when we have gatherings like this, uh, over half the people are still uh, wearing face masks because COVID is especially harmful to people with disabilities. Um, and so that's something to know. If you have a, a center where you're bringing kids together, you might still have some people who are really concerned about COVID, even though the rest of our society might think it's, it's not as big of a deal anymore. However, that wasn't what I was going to talk about. That was just a connection to, to you. Um, I think that uh, access to services for people with disabilities, um, staff shortages, of course, across uh, the states of both Vermont and New Hampshire um, have decreased access. And with staff so shortages, those who are often harmed the most are those who need uh, more care, particularly those with like who need a one-to-one -one aid um, because there just aren't the people for that. We are seeing uh, a lot of people come to us and say, what do we do? My child was rejected from um, after school programs or summer camps um, due to their disability. Like, wait a minute, that's illegal. Let's go, let's go advocate, right? You can't, you can't say that. And they're like, well, they said it was because of their behaviors. I'm gonna look at all of you right now and say the behavior is most likely, like I'm 99% sure because of their disability. And so that actually is not okay either. I'm going to get on my little soap box for that one a little bit. Um, so that, that's been the biggest problem that we're seeing right now is that uh, kids with disabilities are not getting the same kind of access to after school, summer camp, uh, pre-K programs, all of that because of their disability behavior. Thank you. Uh, the short answer is yes. <laughs> the longer answer is no matter what we create, if it is not accessible, it may as well not exist. Um, and, and even worse, non-participation in a service due to access or communication deficiencies will be weaponized and used as justification for defunding a program. They will take a service and they will turn it around and say, no one showed up, we're not paying for this anymore. We saw it with the emergency housing shelters 
in the in the recent past amongst other things but for me what i work with that was the most obvious example the state sets up these emergency housing shelters it's very post-apocalyptic they're not on a bus line they're inaccessible no one shows up and the state says see we told you no one needed housing so we have to be just as intentional about accessibility as we do about the creation of the service itself. Wow, I don't know how I follow that. Um, so, sorry. Um, it's interesting because in some ways, services have been increased and in other ways they haven't, especially for the Abenaki community, but there's a whole other reason for that. And so um, I have found that people are super supportive of, um, like we have new programs for um, doulas and making sure that we have people who are coming in and getting that care um, and training from our, like within our community. So I love that. Um, uh, a bunch of our funding is is drying up for different services, but it's okay. We'll still continue, but we just won't have funding for it. And um, VTRC, we were just start, we just started, so I don't know. We were started in um, we have only been doing it for a year. They did not set us up for success, and so um, we also, in addition to doing, you know, taking stories and well, truths from all of all of our impacted communities in Vermont and outreach and all the things we do, we also have to fundraise. So it's super fun. We're having a great time doing it. <laughs> uh, but um, I feel like there are a lot of avenues where, um, especially in the Abenaki community, our, our kids are often overlooked because when you see us, you don't necessarily see who we are. Um, and so sometimes it's really difficult to um, get the help we need for our kids, especially in schools. So, um, and we do have a different way of experiencing the world and navigating it. And so some of the things that happened, especially post COVID is like our Circle of Courage program, right? Through Mrs. Coy. For 20 something years, it was held in the basement of a, um, of a, a home for the elderly. And it, it, it's perfect, right, for us because we could go with uh, upstairs and read with them and, and cook for them and do all kinds of awesome things and incorporate our elders because it's really important, right? Um, and then they were just kicked out and they had to find a new place to be. All of a sudden, after like over 25 years, I think she's closer to like 27 or 28, and there was no help and it was just kind of surprising. Um, so we're finding it very difficult to continue, but we are, so we're here. We're not going anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Melody, I actually wanna stick with you. Um, this question, I, I really would love to direct it to you and to Yakub, which is, um, I hear about all of the work that you're out in the community doing, or in the case of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the work that you all are, are gearing up to do. Um, and, and thinking about all of that volume of work, how do you, or how do you plan to, meaningfully engage with the people you're serving beyond just that transactional relationship? And I'm thinking specifically more about the collection of truths and what happens after a person has sort of, you know, um, in, in my culture, we have a, a phrase, desahogarse, which means to undrown yourself. After a person has undrowned themselves to you. Yep. Lovely. Um, I was just talking to someone today, like literally about just 20 minutes before I hear, and they said, you know, Susana's like the smartest person I've ever met. And I agree. But anyway, <laughs> um, just saying. So um, that is what we worried about the entire time, and everyone keeps saying, you know, if I was in your job, I'd just do it this way. I'm like, oh, that's great. You should have my job. Um, but, um, but we have taken so long. We're coming out with our, our plan, uh, our strategic plan, and how we're gonna do this work tomorrow on the Statehouse Lawn. And it took us a year 
right? Because we were so intentional and that was the thing we worried most about is how do you really care for people? What does that really mean? And we talked to VTRCs all around the world and not VTRCs, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions all around the world. And what everybody said was that's the most important thing is really caring for people. And especially when you deal with genocidal trauma, um, that is a whole different ball of wax. And people tend to the first, uh, if you're reliving something, you revert to the first reaction you had. And the Canadian TRC came to us a little bit ago and they said, you know, our goal was so that no one committed suicide at the event. I was like, oh, okay. Because that was, for some people, that was a very real reaction, right? And um, we are bringing them to us, <laughs> we are we are actually um, going to learn about genocidal trauma, intergenerational trauma, how everything plays together, and caring for people before, during, and after. Because something is only sacred if you have a continuous relationship with it, right? Just like our our relationships, and I feel like relationships to each other are sacred, and and we're not just collecting truths; we're trying to. We talk about holding them sacred. Um, what does that mean? Um, first, it means that I believe you, right? Like, I'm not going to go fact check everybody. And, oh, did, are you sure this actually happened to you? No. People are telling their truths, and this is what we're going to hear. And the best part about it is it's going to be in the public record forever. <laughs> and so people, that's what I, I got... Um, today, someone called me and they said, you know, I really have to tell my story and I have to tell it tomorrow. I was like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> we're happy to do that. Um, and they said, it, you know, I just don't want anything to happen to other people and I want them people to understand my story so it never happens again. So these will be held um, for people to view. We're going to try to come out with it for many different ways, like... Um, you know, our final report, plus um, maybe a small book that is easily digestible, maybe a whole um, compendium of all of the, the truths that people are telling, and that way people can read them and can really understand. Because first, to change and to understand what's wrong, you have to, like, you have to really listen and take it in. Um, often when we, um, when we have our, our meetings for the, in the Abenaki community, we talk about... Um, we do wampum readings, and um, one of them begins where we pray that um, you are, your eyes are open to what you're about to see, your ears are open to what you're about to hear, and your heart is open to be able to listen and to take it in. Before, notice there's no speaking <laughs> in that. Um, so that's what we're hoping, and... Um, Relate, personal relationships are the hardest things to maintain, especially when you have a whole state birth. <laughs> um, and so I think that's going to be the biggest challenge is meeting people where they're at and going to people and talking to people in their communities and not just saying, you come to me, you're on my terms. No, 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 we're here for you. People keep saying to me, hey, Mel, what do you need? I'm like, no, 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 it's what you need. We're here for you. So that's the whole point. I hope I answered your question. You very much Here you did. Go. Thank you. <laughs> Jakoba, I'd love to hear more um, from you about that. Um, meaningfully engaging with people beyond transactional relationships. One of the things we try to do at ALV is to let uh, program participants drive the programs they want us to build so that it can be much more helpful to their lives. Like I was speaking earlier about uh, some of the groups we run as therapy for the women group, for example. You know, a few years ago when we started having mostly single mothers with children coming from the Great Lake region of Africa, Congo, Burundi, and these are mainly Congolese where we settle in Burundi or Tanzania, Rwanda, some even all the way in Zimbabwe. One of the things that was clear and that's happened was when we were filling the green cards, we'll start asking the names of the parents and the person will break down. Say, why are you asking me about the father of this child? 
I told you something earlier that the father of this one was different than the father of this one. Can't you think and know that they have different parents? I say, okay, I'm sorry. But by the way, why are you asking? You tell them that that's what the federal government is requiring on their application. And she will tell you that, you know, these are my kids. But I was raped. And every time I look at them, I see in them the person who victimized me. I can't hate my kids. Because I love them, even though the person who gave birth to them was the one who tortured me, who took my dignity away. Would you be willing to ask that person to go through counseling? They will tell you, no, I don't need counseling. Because the person I'm talking to doesn't understand what I've gone through. They don't know what I need. Therefore, you would have to ask them, what can we do to help you? They will come with solution. It might seem useless for us, but for them, it represents a lot. Because it gives them a sense of dignity, how to take control of their own lives, how to drive their lives the way it should be, but not the way we, as providers, want to be. And that has been always helpful for us because we always think that if we close today, those who access service to AL, at ALB should be able to take on and help also other community members follow the steps and try to rebuild their lives here in Vermont. Thank you for that. Mm. You know, what I'm hearing in both of your responses, um, a, a lot of what's coming through for me is the emotional and the social connections that we have to make with the people we're serving and how do we hold them and hold the weight of what they're giving to us and sharing with us. And it's not lost on anyone here that in addition to that deep emotional work, we've also got to do the administrative stuff. We've got to schedule things. We've got to uh, organize stuff. We've got to send meeting polls. We've got to email Susana for the ninth time because she's really bad at answering emails, right? Um, I wonder, and, and I'd love to, to hear more from Shauna and from uh, Kendra about this. Um, what are some of the challenges that you are encountering in um, service delivery systems, either the state's service delivery systems or maybe your organization's service delivery systems. And it may have to do with those administrative duties. It may have to do with um, other things entirely. I'm just going to say an elephant in the room right now. Like, I feel like we just got a service delivery question after they got this really emotional, deep question. And, and I'm, I'm having trouble following it. Um, but we're going to go with it. Service delivery. Um, so I talked uh, a little bit earlier about um, people who need to understand that behavior is a, a form of communication. Um, and we need people who are trained to understand that form of communication. It is like an interpreter. Um, and that, so, so staff training is a piece of this service delivery system that I think uh, individuals with disabilities particularly need. Um, I think about the inter intersectionality of all of the groups that we are representing. Um, and uh, for instance, there is a um, uh, young black uh, child who with an intellectual disability lives in a poor area and parents don't have a, a vehicle. Um, every year, this child is signed up for to come to our camp. Our camp is free. We, we do all of our after school programs, all of our summer camp programs, everything is free. Um, so we try to take down barriers. Um, every year he signed up and every year he doesn't come because his mom doesn't have any transportation. Um, and 
Yes, we are looking at, at him from this kind of disability lens, but we also need to look at that intersectionality piece. Um, when you are disabled, you are put down. When you are disabled and you are black, that's another step of uh, difficulty. And then you add poverty to that, and we've got um, a lot of issues. I look at uh, some of the intersectionality with uh, some of Shauna's work, um, and I've uh, had the lovely pleasure of uh, trying to work hard to explain pronouns and gender to a group of six-year-old autistic children, which is really interesting, some of which who are nonverbal. Um, and so the idea of pronouns is like, what? <laughs> They're not really using pronouns anyway. But, um, but really trying to, to understand that because there is a significant overlap with uh, kids on the autism spectrum and uh, transgender. And so the idea of, um, actually, uh, there's, there's a Dartmouth study that's like 25% of autistic individuals are also gender fluid. That's a huge number. <laughs> um, and so, but really trying to, to uh, explain that to a group of autistic kids who really, the idea of gender never made sense to them in the first place, which, amen, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, that, that, that there's some difficulty already there of like, okay, so these other people recognize gender and now we're trying to explain pronouns. And you know, so there's just some difficulties that I'm not sure I'm getting to service at all here. I'm more talking about intersectionality um, here, but it's that understanding of where people are coming from and the training that's needed. So I think I'm going back to training once again um, to work with individuals, whether they have disabilities, whether they, um, they need to have explained to them what pronouns are. Thank you. I have a two word answer, which I slapped on a post-it note on the thing over there, and that is abolish bureaucracy. Abolish bureaucracy. And the question is, are we fighting to create data that satisfies a means test or a legislator's criteria for action? Or are we fighting for people? Are we fighting for justice? We have to ask, what is the problem? You know, Einstein said if he had 60 minutes to solve a problem, he would spend 55 minutes defining the problem, okay? The solution is pretty simple. The hurt, the pain, the injustice is all around us. It's a matter of getting the obstacles out of the way. I'm thinking also of the story of Michelangelo who carved David and all his glory in that stone. Maybe you've seen it. Michelangelo said that he doesn't carve into the stone. He removes stone so the statue is set free. So sometimes our job is not to do but to undo. And we gotta be mindful on where we have power and where we have the power to remove something that's blocking our services and our care. And we find that in the means testing and the bureaucracy that is in the bones of America. Um, and that's another question is like, how do we rationalize abiding by the law or playing by the rules in a system that we know has injustice for bones. Okay, so we just build services and services and services, but we build them in an environment of injustice. And so of course we're always un underfunded or under-resourced or whatever, of course we are. That's the way it is, and we really need to question that. And I'm gonna try to get emotional, I'm gonna squeeze in my emotional answer. And I'm gonna say something really mushy and try to explain myself and I'm gonna say the forbidden word, but Jakobin already said it, so he broke the ice, and that's love. So let love guide you. We already know that, because we're service providers, you know, we do this work, we're caring, we're compassionate people, but for our legislators, if we wanna talk about how do you re remove these obstacles, how do you remove the obstacles of this stuff, let love guide you. Now it's really mushy, and now I'm gonna get a little, try to get more concrete. There are reasons to fear authenticity Almost everyone in this room knows why. Safety is number one. There are reasons to fear authenticity. Our safety is often at risk if we are authentic, which we know is the root of love. To love is to be 
totally open. And that brings us to an earlier point in the program, which was that to share means to open. I cannot share something without opening up, which requires me to choose vulnerability. All right, there's a huge difference between chosen vulnerability and vulnerability that is forced upon you. That difference is vast, and it is everything. We have to choose that. So, safety is the thing, but when fear tips the scale more than love, trust will not be an outcome. Trust is a seed that is planted in very humane moments, in moments of deep humanity and love. That is where trust in that relationship forms, and if our lawmakers and our people who have the power to invest understood and worked with love leading them, we could see a dissolution of those obstacles. Are you reading from a book of poetry or is that from your brain? <laughs> I've been taking some notes this morning during the conversation. I'm improvising a little bit. I'm feeling hella romantic over here. Appreciating all of you for those responses. Um, in just over 10 minutes, we'll be inviting questions from you all, so I'd like to let you know that so that you can start thinking about anything you'd like to ask our panelists. We want to get to as many people's questions as possible, so thank you in advance for being concise. Um, I have a few more for you all, and I would like to do this as kind of a lightning round, meaning I'm going to need it in 15 words or less. <laughs> um, and again, you can go in whatever order you like. The first one um, that I wanna that I wanna jump into is let's throw on our imagination hats. If you had a magic wand so that you could solve one issue in the service delivery system, what would you use that wand to do? Training. Northern Lights has no training for working with kids with disabilities. For me it's staff diversification and also retention. We work hard to train our kids through the, schools, uh, the state school system, but we are not able to maintain them in the state. They are leaving and we are complaining that our agencies don't have a diverse pool of workers or we don't have young talent to take over when some of us retire. The state need to do a better job. Mm. Economic justice, um, we're all great, we're doing a lot, um, but we can't keep doing it without being refilled and replenished. And we will just slowly burn out, and that's what I'm really afraid of in the long run, is really big-hearted service providers burning out because they don't have the support they need. I don't know, this is lovely. I love being with all these people, <laughs> this is so great. Um, and on all of what you, what you have said, I just, I would just echo that because training especially, like even the ability to be like culturally humble enough just to work with human beings has been, wow, um, even that is, is a lot. And so how do you get services people need in a, in a way that they need them? And it's all about love, right? It goes back to what people need, what they want, um, how they want to be treated. So yeah, we keep stealing your mic. I'm sorry. We can all we can. share. Yeah, we have one. <laughs> all right. So based on all of your experiences, what advice would you give to professionals in the field um, who want to do more to provide access to services for vulnerable populations? Go to them. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, I feel like one of the biggest issues, especially even in like the Abenaki community, is um, you really have to go to people because they're not going to go to you. There's a lot of mistrust, especially in government provided services and um, anything related to child services. You're not there's there's little trust, and there hasn't frankly been earned in a lot of respects. And so um, I was working with a, a group that was like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna do all these awesome things in healthcare, and we're gonna expand all these services, and it's gonna be really, you know, culturally humble. And then uh, they're like, oh, what would you say? I was like, yep, yeah, you have to go to people. Like, oh, no, no, we don't do that. 
I was like, oh, well, then I, I, I guess my job here is done if you're not going to listen to me. <laughs> um, because people literally won't. And so like BTRC, we set up 33 locations all across the um, the state we're going to be going for office hours and we're like, okay, this has a high population, let's go there and then we'll have this epicenter. And we, re we did like a week's worth of work on just like, how can we reach the most amount of people? And we came out with the list and people were like, you're not coming to my, my town? I was like, do you know how many towns? And I was like, okay, all right, I will go to your town and I'll set up a special day. And then everyone, oh my gosh, we're going to have such a good year but you have to go to people and you have to earn trust because that's what that's about is making sure you know that you know people know that it's not just another thing that we're taking from people it's like what do you need I don't even know what the question is anymore. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. There you go. <laughs> advice to professionals on expanding access okay. in service delivery. Yeah. My advice is it's a marathon not a race conserve your strength. Rest is also revolution. That's Bell Hooks who said that. Um, and organize and mobilize. If our work, which is centered on humanity, does not have a political element to it, we are ignoring a critical piece of the puzzle and we are walking away from the table and leaving an empty seat. We are privileged if we cannot get political. We must be political. That is the power in this country. For me, it's uh, always trying to remind the state that we are doing a lot with less. Therefore, we are burning those who are on the front line. And that is not sustainable. If you have to recruit or hire every year, retrain, by the time they are ready to serve their communities they are leaving, we are wasting resources. So we really need to be mindful of that and put the resources where the needs are. So instead of talking to you as talking to the state, I'm talking to you as talking to uh, child care providers. I, I, my background is in education. Uh, I was a special ed director in a pre-K through eight school. So I feel like I'm I give practical information, and I'm having a really hard time keeping up with the philosophy of this group. Um, but so my practical information is that it's not what's best for the group as a whole. It's what's best for each individual child. And that is difficult to do. It's difficult to remember. It's hard when you have this one kid who might be causing all kinds of issues in your space but you have to always be thinking for each individual child in your space what's best for that individual child. Another lightning round question for you all, and I know this is, this is hard to do lightning. Um, can you share just a really quick story or anecdote of someone who maybe you helped um, and who's now better off because of a service that you helped provide or connect them with? <laughs> yeah, I need the pressure. Um, probably the best type of story that I hear is, I won't be seeing you anymore. And not in a bad way, but like, you helped me fix my car, that helped me drive to my job, you helped me get my driver's license, that helped me get housing, you helped me get my first paycheck. I won't be seeing you anymore. And I see that a lot working with unhoused and housing insecure folks in Barry City. Um, it doesn't take a lot. Sometimes it's just, sometimes it's $1,000, sometimes it's $500 and a few hours of care. And that's all it takes to get someone out of the pit of despair and on their way to their first paycheck, housing security, reunification with their family, and so forth. You know, one of the beauty, and I spoke with the gentleman again this morning. Last year, during the flood, we had a young woman who fled her, a VC husband, and I was taking uh, ESL classes at ALB, and also preparing to set the LNA license test. So the day of her test, she was going to take the test in Springfield. At some point, she lost her phone signal, 
So of course, we know what's happened. She couldn't hear some of the warning about the upcoming flooding. She kept driving until she hit a large pool of water. She continued and was stranded. Thank God, one of the gentlemen who lived nearby was also leaving his house because the house was being flooded. Saw her and rushed and picked her up. She, they moved to one of the schools and stayed there overnight. The following day, he called us and we went to pick her up. No, few, she missed, of course, her test that day. But in January of this year, she was able to do the LNA and she passed her test. And one thing that really great is this, having this gentleman calling her every single day and asking, if you need help preparing for the test, I'm here. Because he was a retired teacher. And he has offered that and seeing just this little support, saving someone's life, but also reminding her that even though you've missed that opportunity, you can still do better. And today she's passed her test and working at the hospital. You know, this is someone who would contribute to the state, but also be able to take care of her life. So uh, we at the Special Needs Support Center also have um, summer camps, uh, well, whenever school's out, February, April, summer camps uh, for kids just with disabilities. Um, so you know, we have special educators who run them, um, and we have kids who are not traditionally successful, whether in schools or at other camps, um, be extremely successful with us. Um, and that's what led us to start reaching out to other places to, to say, hey, we could, we could help you to be more successful uh, with these, these kids in your program. And so uh, my story today is that uh, something that's coming up this next summer, we, um, this past summer, we, we graduated a group of kids from our program. And what graduation looks like is saying, you now have the skills to go to a camp that all of other same age peers can go to. And what we're going to do to help you with that, to help the fear that you, your parents have, that, to be honest, the other camp has, um, because they've read the IEP, they've read the behavior plan, it's all really scary, is we're going to um, join with this other camp. So for us, uh, we're, Le we're, we're the Upper Valley. So we, we're going to Lebanon, I know that's New Hampshire, but uh, it's the same idea. We're going to Lebanon Parks and Rec, we're gonna spend a week with them, um, in their camp um, and these seven kids are going to join that camp for the week and then they've signed up for the rest of the summer with the Lebanon camp in which we're just having a week of transitioning them. So that's uh, what success can look like. I'm using our mic. Uh, <laughs> um, I will say that um, there can be real magic in just the simple everyday things that we do and um, when I first started with VTRC, um, I spoke to a wonderful woman that had some of the stuff that happened. There's no way I could ever help, you know. But like listening, and I won't tell her tell her story or her truth because it's not mine to tell. But you'll you'll be able to read it at some point. Um, and still, we talk, and it's been a, a year. So like just just the the simple of being able to just listen in a in a way that um, I am empathetic and um, offering support in the way that I can allows people to like I take some of their their worry too on me so I think there's value in that especially in like the whole the whole process that we're trying to do is. Um, with what's happened all throughout the history of Vermont and two people, just the history of all of us about humans, is um, it's much easier when we can do things together. And that includes taking some of the pain and spreading it out so we don't have to feel all of it, right? So there you go. She wrote me a letter the other day. I was like, oh, a letter. I love this. <laughs> no one writes letters anymore. It's great. Anyway. <laughs> Wow. Mm. You've given us so much to think about, all of you. Um, and now we're going to extract more. I would like to invite <laughs> questions <laughs> from you all. What, um, what has piqued your interest? What do you want to know more about? 
What didn't they cover that you'd love to hear them talk about? question is, how do you take care of yourselves? I don't want to answer this question. Because <laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> it's just, um, which is really, like, it's constant. And, like, all the, all the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, that was the one thing everybody said, is you have to have a care team for not only the people that you're helping, but you, because all the secondary traumas and all the things, and I have a one-year-old and a four-year-old at home with me all the time while I do this stuff. Like, um, and it's really hard. And luckily, my mom's usually around, so I can be like, Mom, you always need your mom. And so um, I don't know. I, I fail. I, I give myself an F. Sometimes uh, this type of uh, terminology do not exist in uh, most of the work we are doing. I know some of you leaving the school premises, working all day with uh, the kids, but having also to deal with the family needs can be cumbersome. For me, it's just leaving my computer at home, at uh, my workplace during, uh, at the end of the day and going home. And on weekend, spending some time with uh, three of my grandchildren. No, I seem to be young, but I still I have uh, three grandchildren that keep me on the toes. <laughs> so a few years ago, I would be volunteering with uh, my kids' uh, basketball team, driving them here and there. But now they're all in college, so I have time to do something else. But I miss the basketball driving, because at least you will be taking a bunch of kids. They will be talking silly things, but also reminding you where you came from, how you were at their age, and also how you were also silly. Uh, talking to your parents, you know, but now it's the grandchildren that are keeping me busy and uh, also giving me joy to run after them. I'm really hesitant to give my answer. Uh, I take care of myself by I left education. <laughs> um, so, so maybe that's uh, it, that's true. That is a, a true statement. I got burnt out in education. Uh, I was a system principal. I was in charge of special ed and behavior. And um, what burnt me out was not necessarily. It, it had nothing to do with the people I was working with. I loved working with the people. What burnt me out was I knew what the solution would be, and the system was too inflexible to allow me to be innovative and to make the changes that could refuel me and allow me to keep going. So I moved to the nonprofit world. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm probably misquoting this, someone correct me, but I, maybe Toni Morrison, if dancing's not a part of your revolution, I don't want to be a part of it. So dance. You know, just cutting loose outside under the dappled light coming through the leaves of the tree, fresh air. Basically, breaking out of any boxes or containers because the work that we do is all about criteria and protocol and, you know, boxes to be checked and so forth. And that's such a big part of what frustrates us in our work is that control. So I seek to dance, cut loose, have a cookie, you know, that's it. Oh my God, can I just follow up? I have the best time with my four-year-old who loves Peppa Pig and loves jumping in muddy puddles. So I did it for 45 minutes with her one day, and that was the best ever. So anyway, there's a little self-care. C minus. <laughs> Other questions? The question is, if I could invite each of you for a beverage, a meal, some gustatory experience, where would you be willing to meet me? 
I will start. I am going around 33 locations around the state, and so, and other communities as needed, and so I, I can go anywhere. <laughs> That's the entirety of my job, is I meet people for lunch. <laughs> so uh, you just contact me, and I'll meet anyone. <laughs> well, I can meet anywhere, as long as you have good food. Yes. <laughs> A cup of tea in my living room, surrounded by plants with a cat on my lap. That would be, that'd be great. <laughs> you can bring your own. <laughs> my cat loves other cats. We'll take one more from the crowd. The question is, of all of the daily barriers that vulnerable people face, if there were one that you could fix immediately right now, which would it be? Believe people. Because that would take care of like so many things. I'm just like, right now I'm trying to um, just listen to someone who's having the hardest time just getting medical care. I mean, and it would all just go away if they would listen, right? So I feel like just actually hearing people and not like putting things on others that you think, that would take care of most of our systems, so. Transportation justice. Uh, as messed up as this world is, there are a lot of great services and programs out there if only people had a ride. Stigma? Uh, so the, the statistics would say that a quarter of the people in this room have a disability, and uh, I'm wondering how many people actually share that. And if we started just sharing that we have disabilities and yet we can still do all the things that we do, then uh, maybe we could start trusting that people with disabilities can do all the things as well. For me, it's uh, to invite you to learn about your neighbors learn about their culture, and learn where they're coming from. That would at least decrease the level of bias we have in, our, in some part of our community. Hmm. There's so much to reflect on from what you've given us, and I can't do as good a job as all of you of um, recapping it, but I'd like to try and just pluck out a few themes that, that I heard from the conversation today. One of the things um, that I heard all of you talk about was not just the systemic, the bureaucratic, the social, emotional, and psychological barriers, but also things like infrastructure, right? Melody, you talked about people saying, well, aren't you coming to my town? Um, Shauna, you talked about transportation justice just now. Uh, and the importance of, of having people be able to get around and that programs exist, but they're not reaching people. Kendra, you also talked about um, someone who repeatedly enrolls in the camp program and every year is absent due to lack of transportation. And Jacoba, you shared with us um, thoughtful decisions that AALV, AALV made, like not closing fully and being remote um, so that people could come to receive services in person that that common thread exists, and because Vermont is a difficult place to get around. We also heard you all talking about some of the work that you do in your corners of the world to reach people from different intersectional groups. Melody, you talked about working not just within Vermont's indigenous community, but specifically the Abenaki toddler group, right? Looking at age stratification and bringing our littlest ones into our culture. Um, Shauna, you talked about trans guardians, right? And looking at, again, the the intersection of uh, gender identity and youth. Um, Kendra, of course, you talked a lot about intersectionality, particularly around ability, race, poverty, and gender identity, and how um, the, the statistics many of us didn't know about how many times we'll find those linked in our populations. Are we meeting everybody's needs? Are we even seeing everybody in all of their dimensions? 
we heard from you all about strategies that you've learned um, on how to interact with people. Melody, you talked about the, uh, is it wampum reading? Wampum meeting, uh, readings. Uh, that our eyes are open to what we'll hear, that our ears, to s slow down. <laughs> that our eyes be open to what we'll see, that our ears be open to what we'll hear. And then you said, notice, there's no speaking. And yet, the other side of that coin, Kendra, we heard from you talking about explaining something, like a, a general concept to a group of autistic six-year-olds, um, and understanding the level of detail and patience and the approach that it takes to communicate something to people who receive communication and stimuli in all kinds of different ways. Um, which I think gets back to a point you made, Melody, where you said, um, what does it mean to hold truths sacred? Uh, this idea that everybody has their thing, right? Their history, um, and that it's up to us to hold those sacred. And so in some spaces, that may mean, I see that you have maybe a visible, maybe an invisible disability. And we're going to work with that, and we're going to hold that sacred, and we're not going to means test. Shauna, you talked a lot about are we fighting for means testing or are we fighting for justice? I think a lot of you already know the terrible truth, which is it often costs government more to determine whether you qualify for a program than it would if they just made you eligible and, and provided the benefit. So this idea that some people are out here fighting more for the process than for the outcome. And I think, Jakub, you talked about that when you, when you mentioned um, students going through the system here. You said, you know, they'll push you through the system, but you didn't actually learn anything. Not unless we're making those connections with you as educators. I think, um, you know, we also heard um, some, some really difficult themes to talk about, right? Some of our discussion touched on themes of suicidality, of sexual violence, right? Um, and I'm sure there are other things that maybe I don't identify as triggers, but for some of you, maybe they are. And I think that's a lot like the work that you all do on a regular basis. You never know what you're gonna find. You never know what's gonna come up. And when it does, are you internalizing it? Like Melody told us, do you have a care team, not just for the people you serve, but also for yourself? The secondary trauma is real. And as at least three of you said today, it creates burnout. I think um, one thing I'd, I'd, I'd like to leave you all with, I, I again, I had a lot of really great takeaways from your conversation, but a few things that you each said really, really stuck out to me. Um, Melody, you said, again, what does it mean to hold truth sacred? And you said, number one is I believe you. Shauna, you told us that non-participation in a service due to something like language barrier or accessibility will be weaponized against you and then justify, used to justify shutting down a program. To talk a little bit about the sort of sinister way that systems look to pretend that they've done something and then be able to back away when we predictably somehow can't access it. Kendra, you said to us that behavior is a form of communication. And that is so real, real there's even court cases about it. Even the t-shirt you wear or the piece of cloth that you choose to burn in public view is communication. And are we seeing people in all their forms of communication? And Jacob, you told us that we're doing a lot with less. So we're burning out people on front lines and that that's not sustainable. I have to ask one last question, and this one is optional. Is there anything that has not been said that must be said before we close today, panelists? Personally, I always think of you in uh, the early childhood education programs that are doing more than what we should be assigned to do. We work with families that always rely on you to help the kids 
but you are not just working with this child at home uh, in your school premises or in your facilities. You always think of the well-being of the entire family. That should not be your responsibility. Because the following day, if that child is not in school, you are worried. Maybe the mother doesn't have a place to stay. Maybe they are trying to flee domestic violence. Or the parents are struggling to just pay the utility bills. Yet you want to see that child in class. And you will reach out to the family, and sometimes no one will respond. That will start to be remain in your mind. What's happened to him? What's happened to them? And as a society, we shouldn't be letting other people deal with all the burden. We don't have a lot of resources, but we do have enough resources to take care of each other. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with that, um, in case anyone hasn't thanked everybody for what they do, thank you for all you do, because everybody, I'm sure, does a lot. I want to go to bed. <laughs> Let's uh, challenge our understanding of productivity. A uh, productive community is thriving. If our communities are not thriving, it should be obvious that they are not being productive. And we say things like, it takes a village to raise a child, but it, it, we are the children. It takes a village to let us live free and with health and dignity. So. We really need to start challenging our deeply held understandings of things like what makes us productive, efficient, good. Thank you. When people ask me to do trainings on, um, I do a lot of case studies in my trainings, there's always a hesitancy to even talk about disabilities or people with disabilities because of the language. And there's a fear that you're going to get something wrong, you're going to offend somebody, you're going to cause more harm. Um, and I would just encourage everybody to ask, like, how would you like to be referred to? Um, and that's just a, a good basic question. Please join me in thanking our panelists today. You are very beautiful. Okay. <laughs> Do you have a card? All of you have cards? I have a card. Card exchange. And pass it back to Ali. I want the record to reflect. I almost ended on time. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I don't know about you, but <clears throat> I'm so inspired right now. Yes, and this is not exactly what we expected. I think we got beyond what we expected. And who said that um, Susanna is, is so smart? I mean, I think you're right, because the way in which she just summarized, yes, everything here is, uh, is beautiful. Um, so again, please let's give them another one, a hard one. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Thanks. All right. So now the last part of our agenda is about the closing remarks, and we are delighted to have uh, the deputy director of Building Bright Features, Beth Kruzanski. I know that last name. <laughs> yes. Um, to come up and please give us some closing remarks. And everyone, again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. What an amazing day. Um, so in true Beth Trusansky fashion, I'm not making remarks, but I'm going to turn it over to you to think about what is one thing you are taking from today. I'm going to give the introverts a minute to think. And then you're going to turn to your neighbor and just take what's one thing that you're taking from today. Personally, I know that there has been a lot. So, and then I will bring you back together. Yes. <laughs> 
thank you for being here. Oh, yeah. We have a lot in the office, so they're always I already got two pens. Yeah, I don't, don't let me have one. We're taking home. Friends, the sponsoring legislator. It's been a phenomenal day. I know you're not done talking, and hopefully, if you if you carpooled, you get to talk with your carpool buddy. So first, I want to say thank you to our regional manager team for planning such a spectacular day. And for those of us who are part of the regional councils, they are a gem of our state. And we are, would love to extend, again, in the spirit of um, community and voice matters. And that's something that we talk about a lot at BBF and are inviting you into the kind of this like expedition we are starting, as Sue and Reese talked about this morning, around engaging people whose voices we may not be otherwise hearing and wanting to bring them into the fold so that we can first of all hold their truths, thank you for that, not just stories or experiences, and be able to carry them with care and deliver them in our advisement to leaders to try and make the change that we want. So please, we hope that you will um, consider participating in one of the three um, kind of opportunities as we are working to update the Vermont early, the state's early childhood um, strategic plan. So there's several opportunities. Um, and there's a sheet on your table that you can complete a survey. And then second, to give us feedback on your experience today, um, there's also a survey. So um, take a moment before you leave or um, in the car or whatever that might look like. Um, we would love to hear from you um, and certainly hope that you will stay involved. So thank you for being here. Yes. One quick announcement. Yes. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to announce this to everyone in case you were interested and didn't know about it. But Jumpstart, um, the Jumpstart Coalition, which is all about financial literacy, is happening here on Friday, October 25th. It's for parents, educators, um, and it, anyone who's interested um, in this networking and educational opportunity. But I heard so much come up around financial literacy and access, and this seems so relevant, and I know a lot of people just don't know about it, so I wanted to let you know. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all. Travel safely.